to say that, um, as I always do when she introduces me, that none of this could happen without her because she is such a dynamo and such a <clears throat> enthusiastic person and full of so many ideas. She made Cambria Press happen from nothing within 10 years. I mean, from literally nothing. Uh, and it's really thriving. Those 27 books are just in one series. Cambria Press has many series, like even strategic studies, I think. Security studies. Security studies. I mean, all kinds of things, Latin American studies. So, Sinophone series is just one of the series in, the, in her press, and they're all doing very well. She's flying to conferences all over, um, doing, you know, having a booth at so many different conferences in so many different areas. I mean, I could just go on and on and on telling you how much energy she has. Uh, but Singapore heat makes her a little bit <laughs> devoid of energy. <laughs> okay. Anyway, she's, she's from Singapore, but uh, she has training in Canada and America. Anyway, it's, it's an honor to work with her. Um, so it's a great event. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm surprised that uh, so many people came out at, in this month of the year, July. Some people when, you know, who teach at, say, NUS Yale, went back to the uh, North America for the summer or to other places. But we have a good turnout, a very good turnout. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with the reputation of Cambria and the authors who we're introducing today and the fame of this gallery. <laughs> Uh, it's a great place to have it. I hope I say the name of the gallery correctly. It's a great pleasure to be here at my appreciation. Correct? Thank you. Okay. It's a very clever name. Um, especially because it holds the paintings of one of our authors, uh, Nobel laureate Gaoxing Jen. His eponymous work, his book, uh, Gaoxing Jen, Aesthetics and Creation, was published in the Cambria Sinophone World Series in 2012, and very successfully launched at the MLA annual convention where Gao himself was a distinguished guest of honor. That was quite an event in Boston. Um, since the publication of that book, Gao has embarked on many more creative projects uh, that go beyond writing and painting. I am therefore very pleased to have this book, uh, Gao Xingjian and Transmedia Aesthetics, from Professor Mabel Lee, who's here, and uh, from the University of Sydney, and Professor Liu Jenli from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology that covers Gao's entire body of work and brings us up to date on Gao's uh, oeuvre. I'm, uh, I would like to convey the apologies from Liu Zhenli and Gao Xingjian, who were not able to be here today. Um, this book has earned rave reviews uh, from top scholars like Michael Hawk, professor of Chinese literature, and director of the Liu Institute for Asian and Asian Studies at the University of Notre Dame, or as we say in America, Notre Dame, um, who praises the book, uh, stating that, quote, this collection offers a valuable mixture of critical appreciations and adds significantly to our knowledge's, knowledge of Gao's oeuvre in all of its complexity. Uh, Mabel will speak more about this book in a moment. Before that, I am also pleased to introduce another book, also edited by Mabel. She has a lot of energy, too. <laughs> uh, this is Painting History, China's Revolution in a Global Context, by celebrity artist Chen Jiawei, who is also here today. Uh, I think he was introduced at the beginning. And he will be speaking about this book, which John McDonald, art critic for the Sydney Morning Herald, had this to say. 
Never content to simply record history, Shen Jiawei has taken a rigorously critical, analytical approach to the great movements and great figures that have shaped our world. This is true of his writing, no less than his painting. And he has given us the rarest of books, a masterful history, le history lesson by a master artist. We are therefore very pleased to have this master artist here today to tell us more about his book. And now I invite uh, Mabel Lee to come up and speak. <laughs> very much, colleagues and friends. Uh, I've been involved with three books, actually. Uh, one, two. The third one I have an article in there. Uh, and the third book, if you'd like me to show it, is called Texts and Transformations, also published by Cambria Press. And all the three books all were published in March, I think, this year. Um, I have an article here called um, Gosling Jen's Absurdist Aesthetics. Aesthetics. What I've written about. Anyway, uh, this book was uh, uh, edited by Paul Stasi, who uh, has brought together essays from all over the world. Uh, to celebrate Victor's 75th birthday. And it's a great surprise, and there's a video of him looking at the surprise at the start of what's happening here. Anyway, um, I draw your attention to this book, it's got wonderful uh, essays in it, and it shows uh, the coverage of Victor's uh, <coughs> interests and expertise. I mean, Tony's mentioned a bit about him, but He's also very interested in archaeology and he's brought a lot of these old texts back to life and he's inspired a generation of new scholars. Um, so I say from a distance. Um, anyway, talking uh, these two books that I've been heavily involved with, I'll talk about the first one. Liu Zhengmei, uh, Liu Zhengmei's daughter, and, uh, who's at um, Science and Technology in Hong Kong, came to me and said, we should do this book of essays uh, about Kao Xingzhen's paintings. And it was sort of like a few odd essays here and there. And I said, why don't we you know, make it into something big and positive? Because Gossinger's writing all over the place, it's different areas and genres. There are not many people who are bringing things together. It's just too fast and people are getting exhausted because they don't know the fields that he's talking about. So some of these essays are beginning to look at different areas, and particularly Yuzhen himself is probably one of the few people in the world who have been tracking. Uh, Gottingen's work since the 1970s. He knew Liu Zhenmei when she was a kid. Um, anyway, she's grown up now. She's a professor at Science and Technology in Hong Kong and a professor of Chinese literature. So it was she who was the moving force, starting force. Uh, and I'm the person who hits people over the head and says, make it better, make it better. You've got to get it through <laughs> Tony Tan. Uh, otherwise, they'll knock us back and we won't get it published. Anyway, we did beat it into shape. Uh, and Tony put the following as the, the final touches. That was very important. And having worked with Tony over two books and then three. I can say four, have I done a four? Okay, you know, she's marvellous. Uh, and not just her, but her whole team. And it's just incredible, the effort that has gone into it. And because I was in publishing myself, like the lone range of publishing, uh, I didn't have a team, but I could see exactly what's happening. 
And so many people and so many authors don't realise how much goes into editing. It's a huge amount of uh, disciplined work and I, I really appreciated that. Um, anyway, I have to doubly thank Helena Chan, where is she? Here, Helena. Um, thanks for sponsoring to today's event and also for co-sponsoring the paperback edition of Shen Jiawei's book, uh, Painting History. There's a hardback version, but we wanted um, to, uh, the book to reach a large number of people because what he's written in that book uh, is really quite valuable as source material for studying uh, Chinese history, um, not just art, but understanding China at the grassroots level because he talks about very personal little things in the book, which are actually quite important. And because people are always looking at the bigger picture, they don't think of uh, what ordinary people are going through and how the experiences are and how it's shaped things. Um, so the paperback edition was important. And I think it's not just supported these events, but a few years back when um, that, that first volume, Gottingen's, uh, the Gottingen wrote called Aesthetics and Creation, um, I was desperate, you know, if I have a launch, I like it to be a party. And so I said, Helena, I need some more money to have a proper launch. And so Helena, as always, came forward and uh, she bankrolled a very nice launch uh, in Boston for the Modern Languages Conference. And that was a big event with a thousand what, participants or something. Yeah. Uh, Eight thousand. Eight thousand? Nearly ten thousand. Ten thousand, okay. <laughs> well, in America they do things big. <laughs> uh, but uh, Helena also represents Gottingen's paintings. This is one of the works here, for example, <coughs> black and white. Uh, she represents Gottingen's art in the Asia Pacific area, and she took the first major exhibition of his works to the USA in 2007 to Notre Dame University. Um, so, Gottingen owes a lot to Helena. I owe a lot to Helena. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Helena. Anyway, uh, since uh, Gottingen won the 2000 Nobel Prize, uh, he's been internationally acclaimed for his unique, innovative um, breakthrough uh, works in literature and literary aesthetics. Uh, although there's still a uh, a lot of research to be done on. People just find it difficult to tackle because it's working in so many different areas. Uh, Gottingen is equally erudite in European and classical Chinese literary and arts traditions. He also has an insatiable curiosity about doing different things with every piece of work he creates. Um, so as I said, that's a pop problem for researchers, the late say, if only he could slow down a bit. In fact, he was actually sort of expressed that in uh, Gottingen has finally announced that he will retire. He says, ah, oh, good, now we can all try and catch up. Um, look, 15 years after the Nobel win in 2015, Gottingen received an extraordinary honour. Um, Belgium uh, gave him a great honour for his art, uh, and I suppose this would equal his Nobel achievement in literature. The Belgian Royal Museum of Fine Arts uh, in Brussels dedicated a whole uh, to his paintings, quite a huge hall 
on the ground floor. And I don't think many living artists go to this sort of honour. It's a huge hall, and it's five large, very large ink paintings that represent the human unconscious. Um, all in black and white. And at the same time, there's the largest um, retrospective he has ever had uh, in his life, also in Brussels, uh, at the University of, oh, not the University, Art Museum at Ixel. Um, and it has won a high acclaim. But a lot, a lot of the publicity somehow is kept in Europe. It doesn't seem to proliferate uh, across the world, but it will. We are doing it now, uh, trying to proliferate. Um, Gottingen's creative exploration has crossed boundaries. Uh, I, I reckon he was a child prodigy. Uh, he was writing poems and doing paintings when he was about a five-year-old. Um, he's brought up in a very cosmopolitan family background. We sort of think of growing up in China, how can he possibly know that much about you know, French literature? How could he be reading all those fairy tales, Grimm's fairy tales when he was a kid? I don't think I read them when I was a kid. And we are actually the same age, but with four weeks uh, difference. Um, Anyway, he was born in January 1940 in the Republic of China, uh, but educated in the People's Republic. Um, he was a sickly child, and so his mother educated him at home. But when he went to high school, he loved already had a manic reading habit. He was a vivifier. And his school in Nanjing happened to be established by boxer indemnity funds. So the library was huge, huge with translations. And he just read his way through and volunteered to be library monitor. And so he just stayed reading and reading. Um, and this is why his, his uh, education was in both cultures. And he loved literature, uh, not, not the prescribed reading of Montadon or prescribed classical writings, but he was interested in fiction and things where the imagination could roam. Um, so, this book of essays, uh, Gen and Transmedia Aesthetics, is about scholars who try to talk about how his writings lead from one genre to the other from one discipline to another. So it's not just literature, it's film, uh, it's European paintings, uh, photography, he's interested in all these, and he leads them all into one another. They go into his, the, the visual arts go into his literature, his literary forms and poetry goes into his visual arts. Um, so far he has done three films, which I think are significant, because he, he believes that films shouldn't be dominated just by the visual thing. Um, he, want, he, he wants to, I mean, he's curious, he plays around. So he said, I'll just separate the sound from the visual image um, and from, from language. And he, he does that in his first film, which is semi-autobiographical, but when he becomes ill and um, collapses, is carted off in the taxi, and they say, you've got to change your lifestyle, otherwise you'll be dead. Um, he didn't immediately change his life but he had another collapse and he did change his lifestyle because he had to. So he went on a total diet, became vegetarian for over, uh, he's still vegetarian, maybe he's a tiny bit of fish. Um, 
but he could have died at that time because he was just manic, workaholic, control freak, all those things. Um, but now he blends everything together. In this painting here, for example, you can see that it's not like a traditional Chinese ink painting because his interest in perspective, this is something he learned from oil painting. So he, he's uh, brought perspective into Chinese ink painting. Um, and then afterwards in his films, he uses his paintings as backdrops. He, has, he wants movement, so he has his dancers dancing in front of his paintings and he's filming it. Anyway, these are just his, his way of uh, trying different things. Um, so I pointed to his love of reading and I, I think that's important because in China there were lots of gaps where people who really wanted to read could read. And the same thing happened with another such person who loved reading, and that's Shen Wei. So I'm going to invite Shen Wei to tell us about his uh, reading experiences in China, and also tell us about his paintings um, in China. And he loves to talk. Shen <laughs> Wei, please.
So then has all of level in the in the in the all the country like that the, 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 the government and the leadership they organize the young people or the uh, amateur artists to doing the uh, doing the works to uh, to work for the cultural uh, revolution propaganda. So I got a lot of uh, opportunity. So uh, in, during the ten years in the cultural revolution, we had two. Uh, national exhibition. So at the first one, my one did a research to Beijing. Because my one much close on the real life. But at that time, they want uh, the much, they, they call it high their life. It, it means uh, the more, more, uh, more red. And in China, we, we call it Hong Kong Liang. More red or more bright or more smooth. Um, so, uh, my next, uh, second exhibition, my uh, painting called uh, Standing Guard for Our Great Motherland. That one was selected to Beijing. Uh, but, but unfortunately, when I, when I came to Beijing, I saw my painting hanging in a very good place in the uh, National Art Gallery, just a simple little bit left. <laughs> then we come to work close uh, uh, I surprised the two faces of the soldier already champion. Because uh, my the two faces is the crime of my painting. Is a, it is a, I, I spent months to, to do that. Is a, I watching from the uh, nature that the that my friend to stand on the morning in the in the uh, snow land and see the young the, the sunshine, how the color changes, how that, that is very good. But, uh, but the way the painting sent to Beijing is that uh, Jiang Qing uh, asked uh, one of the uh, uh, China Mao's relatives, the lady, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Su Wang. So Mr. Su Wang uh, is chief curator, so had organized a small, uh, small artist group. And, uh, she trusted them. So asked them to all make elder painting. Get to the standard, she, she, she sought this standard. So my one, the two face, because uh, uh, she sought uh, these two soldiers to sing a bad enough. <laughs> not red enough. <laughs> so done that. Uh, this painting is uh, 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 with another about uh, a bottle, uh, one down, one down, about 12 paintings were placed by Jiang Qing. So it automatically come into the collection of the uh, national, uh, today we call the National Art Museum. And uh, uh, without any money. <laughs> and uh, then is, uh, uh, the, the painting uh, in, uh, after the Cultural Revolution, uh, after 1981, uh, the painting automatically came, sent back to my uh, province. Because they thought this is a judging place, it must be a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> but but the painting not come back to my, my hand because uh, we all left and I am already servicing the army. So one day my friend is still working in that province. Two days later, your, your painting I saw in some underground uh, store is really damaged already. Uh, uh, missed all of the scratches. So, so said you can pick up back. So I pick up back, put it on across uh, the runway. So everything, uh, every color la layer is broken. So I come back, put it in my, um, in China that time, we have very small uh, specs that under my back. back. So afterward, uh, about, uh, about 17 years, 16 years after, I already seen uh, I get the letter from uh, New York with a, uh, a professor who sent to me the chapter. She's an American uh, scholar, uh, Julia. Julia, uh, Andrew, I think, is a Chinese name is uh, Anya. So she asked me, she become the curator of that year, next year, for going uh, about the China art five thousand years and the, the modern part. She was, she, was, she was the creator. So asked me where the painting. She said that the painting is very important to us. So then I bring to Shinbi, I tried to restore it. Uh, and fortunate or unfortunately, the so face too thick and gone. So, so I have to rebuild the, 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 the fences. But the fence, I had uh, all the material there. Uh, so I have 
so I need to very carefully to become the real life before. The painting today, afterward, uh, twice uh, showing in New York, in 1998 and in uh, 2008. And uh, now, we, uh, afterward, I auctioned the painting. So now it's in the collection of the Long Museum in Shanghai. Together with uh, all of the study books, I also saw that. So uh, this year, in later of September, uh, the Long Museum is going to have a special exhibition about this painting and all of the materials. Uh, probably the, the title is uh, One Painting at One Time. Uh, the curator, curator uh, is uh, Chen Li Shen, and uh, he is uh, just a retired from. National Museum of China, uh, uh, vice uh, uh, director. Uh, here is uh, now. Uh, I, last I want to tell you is uh, all the story in the book. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, the last article is about uh, Champion. Is uh, this mm -hmm. this project? Mm -hmm. um, Champion is uh, I believe this one because uh, Singapore is uh, at Champion's time with uh, Malaysia, uh, the, the, the same, same country, is, uh, is, uh, under the ruling of uh, uh, British. So I get the commission in the year 2006 to do a Malaysia action painting and 260 people on the painting. So uh, the commission, the, the person commissioned me, uh, yeah, it was a, a, a very great uh, Business man, Mr. Uh, Mr. Yang, uh, and uh, he asked me for ten years. Then said, uh, he said you must do start. Uh, if you not go, we all go, going to all go and die. And I said okay, I do that. <laughs> so I asked my fellow artist, my wife, and another Sui, we are doing that that night. So he offered us to traveling in Malaysia. Before the travel, he told me that the last month I had uh, had a dinner with uh, Chen Ping. I said, Chen Ping? I said, Chen Ping is the, 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 the chief sec secretary of the Malaya Communist Party. I said, this Communist Party, and you are capitalist. <laughs> why, why you can't have dinner? And he, he said, uh, he said uh, because our father comes from the same village, from Fujian. Uh, then I said, could you? To lend me to see Champion because I uh, know nothing about Champion, but I, I read, only read from the newspaper that uh, he already had a reconciliation with the government and uh, all the weapons already gone, so stopped the, the, the fighting. Uh, then he said, uh, No problem, I will explain that. So when we got to uh, Kuala Lumpur, the same day, could it happened in Bangkok? So we saw that it probably uh, couldn't be there, uh, but, uh, but still going, because the, that could be very peaceful, you know, the passing of the, of the, of the So uh, Mr. Yap to, uh, had uh, um, booking three rooms in the Olympia Hotel. So middle way is Chengping and uh, uh, his, uh, his young generation, uh, just like uh, Assistant, and then the, me and my my, my uh, fellow artist, and another is uh, Mr. Yang. So we had two days talking uh, and joint sketch. I, I joined uh, twice. Uh, another one gave to him. This is my gift. Yeah. Um, Chen Ping is a uh, I very respect him uh, because uh, Chen Ping is an interesting. Chen Ping, Chen Ping asked me, um, "What's your uh, why you want?" Which uh, we, we told him, I said, uh, we used to be a Communist Party member before the Tiananmen Square massacre. But we left there. And then he said, uh, he said uh, you, you must uh, or hate me. He said, uh, because uh, uh, some things uh, uh, happened, uh, 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 he didn't say anything about that, some powerful thing. So let us. We know nothing about it because the, the ordinary Chinese people we know nothing about it, or the background, or what happened. So, uh, we, 
very lucky that the book already published in Chicago called uh, The Story of Outside, mostly in Chinese and English. Uh, the, 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 the book is uh, also very uh, interesting uh, story because uh, uh, in the, all the Malaysia emergency time, the war time, had a uh, when English uh, uh, report to work for the uh, London, the, the, uh, I think the day uh, the, the, the newspaper. So uh, he report all of the war after the war finished, and he had strong enough to know what the, another side, the communist side, how they think about it, how they feel. So he to try to make it some team and uh, join together. And have this work. About 100 hours recording. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that I had. Um, actually, uh, when I joined that, is uh, uh, chanting, sitting and uh, watching on the window. And uh, he said, uh, uh, when I was done, please uh, put up my ash into the jungle. All of his uh, comments are valid because uh, uh, he had uh, his uh, applying uh, when he was uh, 14 years old against the Japanese uh, with his guerrilla. And the uh, English troops sent us a second protect them. So we had a very close, uh, uh, very close relationship and a great uh, friendship together from Chengping and with. Uh, Major, major, uh, major John. So, Major John is when uh, 1955 so they had uh, used to be talking about peace. So, English, uh, British government sent uh, Major John together to respect, uh, uh, to, to want to protect uh, and take peace. So, they joined together. Yeah. So, when the, the, this, this is talking to the, the federal. Next day, Chiping come back to Jango. So the uh, major job to stand together, come to the, the, the edge of the jungle. They had an overnight sleep. So at that uh, evening, they, they both started. Uh, they said that uh, uh, they, they had a common language. Uh, half number is uh, English, some half number Malaysian, most uh, Chinese. So, uh, all of the English, uh, the in English troops, John, Major John said they are now very good, they are very, very good, they are working in what company, they, they represent or something. And all the John asked uh, Chen Ping what people in the companies may say to do that. So, so this is what happened. So uh, when uh, afterwards uh, we, we met together, I think it is a uh, Probably the twenty thirteen and he passed away. Uh, I, I, I read the news. His family wanted to bury him in, into Malaysia. Malaysia. Okay. Yeah, this is all the story. But story of more details in the book. <laughs> uh, when I met to uh, when I met uh, with uh, with uh, uh, Chen Ping, I asked Chen Ping. I said, uh, "Could you give me a?" Uh, your, your soldier's cap. So when I come back to see you, he sent this cap to me. This I bring it. It's a the same same color as the Chinese uh, version, but this one, this one should. They uh, when they are in the jungle, uh, they have many years and nothing to do. So
there from there. So what was there was 
of what was left before 1937, before the Japanese took Ranji. There was nothing, almost nothing in between. So I remember the library being very sparse. So the idea that he had access to all those books in high school, what a wonderful start, and that's really enviable. Uh, and as for the, uh, the stories, I have to say I never really appreciated his painting. I'm just not very good at that. But I did love his uh, novels. That's about all I really know about, uh, about the Gosh and James' work. And uh, I regret very much that I did not uh, follow it more closely. But it's, uh, it's something that I, I, I must try and do, and I look forward to learning more about his painting. I, I also found it very fascinating, another little bit of the spider's web, that uh, our, our author about painting history, also a great friend of a friend of ours, that uh, who's a historian like, like me. We were colleagues in the ANU, and he just told me the sad story. I have, may I, if I may tell the story? It's a little sad story because Lohoi Ming spent his life, a lot, a big part of his life, doing research work on Morrison, the great George Morrison, who was correspondent in China and led a fantastic, brilliant life in, in very effectively acting on developments in China and Beijing in the late uh, 19th century to the early 20th century. And he had a fantastic diary. And Lo Huimin spent his life really editing that diary, annotating it, tremendous loving care, checking everything. Brilliant piece of work. But it was so large, he never could find a publisher. I don't, I don't know uh, how hard he tried, but he, he, he did try. Uh, ANU supported him up to the point of doing the research, but the press team wasn't interested. Too big a project. And they published the small parts, two volumes of small parts of it, but never got around to the main thing. And when he died, we were all very concerned about what happened to all that research work that he had done. And uh, none of us could find it. In fact, uh, I was recently in Canberra and I saw Jeremy Bowie and he, he told me he was very upset when he discovered that all those manuscripts were. All it was, I mean, I don't know much of the covers of it, were all sent to Beijing. And uh, Mr. Shen just told me that uh, when he discovered where it was, it had been in Beijing for three years without being opened. It was left in, just in their boxes without being opened. I mean, that is really tragic. And I have to say this, I, I am very interested in a particular project which had somehow been linked up with this, and I haven't connected the two is the big project to write the history of the Qing dynasty. Mm -hmm. I've been talking about this for ages, and ever since 1912, we've been talking about it <laughs> for more than 100 years. And the early uh, uh, supporters of the Qing were uh, the Qing Yilao, who very loyally produced the Qing Shu, which nobody acknowledged officially. So it remains a Qing Shu now, and they couldn't, they somehow again couldn't manage to do it, but they were partly, at least that's understandable, the problem of civil war, the war with Japan, the, the years of Chen there's no way they could have done it properly. But when the communists came, I mean, the whole, in fact, in, in the midst of all this, there was a kind of rejection of Ching Shu. Ching Shu was to do with feudal, dynastic period, and so on. We had nothing to do with it, all to do with Confucianism, Confucian historiography, and uh, since May 4th, we've been denying all that, you know, throw the Confucians out and, and all that. So there was a great resistance to it. There was a kind of ambivalence about that there should be a, a Qing Shu because there's a great gap. And at the same time, the rejection of the whole idea of a dynastic history was very strong among the, the professional historians of the time. Most of the best historians of the time said that uh, when we're now talking about modern history, and they set out to define modern history as starting in 1840. Ah, you know, the Opium War was the beginning of modern history. All Jin started in 1840. That was fine, I mean, because of the rejection of the dynastic tradition, that was fine. But uh, as you can imagine, over the decade of the 20th century, we soon discovered there was something wrong, something missing. That is, uh, the official histories, recognized histories, stopped in 1644 with the Ming history. And 
then modern history began in 1840. What happened in between the 200 years? Uh, they had tremendous difficulty because once they decided modern history in 1840, and that dynastic history ended in 1644, there's something wrong somewhere. They don't. They did not know how to handle it. So in the end, my friend Dai, as you know, who had been pestering the government for years, he's a Qing historian, pestering the government for years to revive his Qing history project. And finally, I think he persuaded Jiang Zemin to put in a big sum of money, engaging his hundreds of historians based in the Ramin Dynasty to write the Qing history. That was now 20 years ago. I heard uh, some months back that they finished it. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> 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 when is it come out? But anyway, I was delighted to learn, finally, anyway, I'm not yet. I was so sad to learn that it was Dai's group that got what the uh, means Morrison papers. All those papers were deposited with Ramin Dash, yeah? And I'm not sure they used it. Uh, That's right. They used it. Did, they, did they want them for the purpose of using them? In the this is what I think the understanding was that this Morrison project included some of the most valuable research done by one man who spent most of his life doing it. Christian Heiss. And, and the papers that, not my boyfriend, he's one of them, he's not really, it's a product of the. I can't do now on the accommodation that it's an open departure. In the times of this report of the Chinese Chinese, and sure that all of the diary. So, yeah. so we we now we have to basically have to discover whether they use Morrison, uh, the local news, Morrison papers or not in the research. Anyway, the, 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 the news is that Qing Shi is now ready, mm -hmm. but not published. Uh, apparently, it's enormous work. I have no idea what, what what's going to happen. Dai is still alive, but in his 90s, so I hope we publish it fairly soon. So I, I, I was delighted to learn about it. If you can, you, you should have write a letter to Dai. Uh, because <laughs> it would make any difference. I'm sure these hundreds of volumes or whatever they've written is in the hands of the reviewers. Uh, I think the Chinese Communist Party is a department which especially reviews these things. So I think it may take another 20 years. <laughs> For all I know. But nevertheless, I was delighted to learn from Today. At least we know the papers are deposited there, and at least if if Dai has something to do with it, I can't believe that he will not look into it. He will not make sure. Very hopeful. Well, see, today I learned so much just coming to look at three new books, but I learned so many other things. So thank you all very much for this chance. <laughs>